So welcome everybody to tonight's um, webinar, which is a balanced mindset. And uh, we're very lucky to have Chris here tonight, who's going Hello. to go through everything with us. And uh, whilst you're coming in and sort of settling in, just to let you know, I've put a couple of links in chat. One is uh, to join our community and you can click on that link to go through or save it somewhere. And the other one is for joining our newsletter. So we send a newsletter out once a week, just with, it's almost like a, a weekly roundup, isn't it, Chris? Just with everything yep. that's gone on that you can just click on and easily get. The slides will be there for you to download and uh, the replay of the, of the webinar tonight as well. So we also would love it if you go to chat and say hello before we start, say hello and whereabouts in the country you're from or indeed which country you're from, because sometimes we have people from all sorts of far away places, don't we, Chris? We do, it's very oh, exciting. So um, as always, uh, we will be, or Chris will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. And what I'd ask you to do is when you think of a question, just pop it in Q and A. So rather you didn't put it in chat, because sometimes we miss it in chat, but if you see at the bottom of your screens, you'll see a little button that says Q&A. If you click on that and that will come open and then anything that you think of, just pop in there and Chris will answer at the end. And uh, we always love it when you ask questions, especially if we run out of time. <laughs> I so, love it when people ask questions because it always gets me thinking. I was thinking, that's a really good question. I hadn't thought of that. So yeah, I love it when you ask questions. So, yes, let us know who you are and where you're from in chat. And you can also send um, messages in chat. So without any further ado, Chris, I'm going to hand over to you to talk Thank to you. us. And I'm going to um, mute and stop my video. So enjoy. Thank you. So good evening. Um, and those of you who came uh, to our webinar last week, uh, know that the sort of the background to uh, why we called this particular uh, webinar the balanced mindset was because um, several months uh, several weeks ago we did um, a series on balance and falls and um, I was talking to the guys after this their first session that they did for us um, and we were started to just talking about the importance of mindset um, to um, somebody's ability to balance and so that's where this webinar um, came from. It came in response to um, thinking about, so we do an awful lot of work um, physically with people around their balance, but how much work do we do with them around uh, developing a balanced mindset? So that's what we're gonna be exploring tonight. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna do, we're gonna do three things tonight. First thing I want to do is I want to introduce you to um, a client um, that uh, Caroline and I worked with, uh, must be about a year to 18 months ago now. I have her permission to talk about uh, her particular experiences. Um, so I'm gonna introduce you to Lorna and I'm gonna introduce you to, um, first of all, how she, her stroke, and then to the, the challenges that she um, had to overcome as she was um, on her stroke uh, rehab journey. Um, and the reason I'm going to do that is because what I want to do as uh, I start to, on the second part, I'm going to be talking about what anxiety actually is. Because one of the things that we all know is that anxiety is one of the key uh, things that affects our ability to balance because we end up in an anxious place um, and as anxiety builds so that has a massive impact on our body um, and it can have a massive impact on our ability to stay upright so we're going to be talking about that so I'm going to be telling you um, a little bit about Lorna and then we're going to introduce you to anxiety and then I'm going to reintroduce Lorna um, and talk to you about Lorna's anxiety and how um, the first stage of working with Lorna was to help her to understand her brain and how her brain was working and how um, her brain created anxiety. And the third thing we're going to be talking about is therefore the journey from anxiety to calm and relaxation. Because as we all know, the things that cause us the most challenges can also be are also the things that we can use to help us with our healing. 
So the process of creating anxiety when um, reversed is the process for creating relaxation and calm. So that's what we're going to go. We're going to be talking a bit about Lorna and we're going to be talking about anxiety. And then we're going to be talking about um, the work that Caro and I did with Lorna um, as part of her uh, rehab journey. So let's start with Lorna. So Lorna um, is in her mid 40s and uh, she had her stroke. I think it's about four years uh, um, ago now. Um, and we started working with her two years into her uh, rehab journey, which was quite an interesting time to begin working with her. Um, so her stroke uh, came about um, when she was driving. So it was it was a really terrifying experience for her. She was driving round a roundabout and uh, she started to experience her stroke um, symptoms. Lorna's background, uh, she works in the NHS, so she had a sense of what was going on and she was able to pull over into a lay by. She was able to make a phone call and she was able to get support and help and she was able to get to hospital. Um, the stroke left her with um, a number of challenges. One, she had um, a dead leg. She had a dead leg, left leg. Well, that's her word, so I'm using them. But a dead left leg. Um, and she also had challenges with her peripheral vision. And the third thing that, uh, no surprises, uh, her stroke left her with um, incredible anxiety. And the anxiety um, was around a number of things. Uh, the first level was that she didn't actually feel able to trust herself because um, she was very worried that even though she'd had, uh, she'd managed her stroke really amazingly, she was still very, very nervous about her ability and capability should anything happen again. Um, and she was really struggling with her peripheral vision and the impact that her peripheral vision had on um, how she was able to live her life. So that's Lorna, um, and I'm going to just ask Caro to uh, start sharing her screen because I'm just going to start to go through some slides with you. Um, so uh, just want to start um, with uh, the impact of trauma, and we've just started a little bit to explore that. Um, so Lorna didn't experience all of these, but she experienced some of them. And as I've said already, the first thing that Lorna experienced as a result of her stroke was a distrust in herself. So she, she would say things like, I, I just don't trust myself. And I certainly don't trust my body. My body let me down. And this distrust brought all sorts of levels of anxiety for Lorna when she was trying new things. Um, so when she was um, walking, she would... Uh, be really nervous about going out in public places. She became very nervous about going on public transport um, because she was just really worried, first of all, that she might have another uh, stroke, but, but more, more importantly, I think, than that, that she wouldn't be able to stay upright, that she would somehow um, fall over and that in the process of falling over, she would really embarrass herself and, and potentially hurt herself. Um, she was also very judgmental of herself and she would um, criticise herself and blame various aspects um, of her body. And that's quite typical with people who've experienced trauma is they kind of disassociate from um, parts of their bodies um, and then they start to uh, comment and criticise and judge those parts of their bodies as if they're not part of themselves. So my legs let me down and in Lorna's case, my eyes just let me down. Um, they're just they're just not like they used to be. And I don't know what I'm going to do um, because I need to do something about them. They're just and, and they became this um, thing that Lorna was just really angry with. Uh, people can also, as, as a result of trauma, become very wary of people around them because they're wary of how people might judge them. And one of the things that she was very wary of was if I go on public transport and I'm not walking properly and I'm um, somehow sort of a bit wobbly, then people might think I'm drunk and people might uh, think that um, I am not, not capable and they're going to judge me. So she was very wary about trying new things and doing new things around other people. 
Um, Lorna didn't do this, but other people do uh, project onto others um, and um, imagine that um, what people are uh, going to be saying and also projecting and saying, well, it's all their fault. Um, you know, I can't do this because it's 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 not about me. It's about the other person. Somehow they're letting me down. Um, and I know Lorna's father had a stroke um, a, a few years before she did. And one of the things that she struggled with in terms of her father's response to his stroke was that he would blame her. So every time he was trying to stand up um, and he couldn't stand up, he'd say, oh, get out of my way. It's your fault. I can't do this because it's you. So a lot of people, as I said, project onto other people. Vulnerability. Now, people go. To, I think people go two ways with vulnerability. Some people go into I'm completely helpless, um, and other people go into I'm not letting people see my vulnerability and um, my challenges. Um, and in Lorna's case, um, she struggled with vulnerability, and she struggled um, to let people help her. So um, she was always trying to do things for herself, which is absolutely amazing. But there were times when she actually did need some support. Um, and as we go on to feeling unsafe, um, a lot of the time she would oscillate between feeling OK and then feeling unsafe. Um, and as a result of um, her stroke, she developed um, some really unhelpful beliefs that were holding her back. Now, these weren't new. She'd already in um, her life had insecurities and challenges um, around uh, her capability and her competent, her competence. And what the stroke did was it just exacerbated that. So she um, she 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 knew very well how to criticise herself. Um, and so the stroke just really took her into another realm of self uh, criticism. So if we can just move on to the next slide, Caro, thank you. So the outcomes, this isn't Lorna, by the way, those of you who came last week seen this lady before. Um, her outcomes were to um, accept herself and accept herself for where she was right there in the here and now. She wanted to trust herself. She wanted to trust who she was, her character, her capability and her body. And um, as we talked about uh, through her outcomes, uh, it became clearer and clearer and clearer that she also really wanted to learn compassion and self-love because as she always said to both Caro and I, um, her stroke was um, challenging and painful and difficult, but it was also a transformational experience. And she saw it as an opportunity or her rehab as an opportunity to make some changes to things that were unhelpful before she had a stroke. So she wanted to accept herself. She wanted to trust herself. She wanted to feel safe. She wanted to know uh, that all was well and she sort of knew that because when she had her stroke, she managed to care for herself incredibly well. So she she sort of knew that, but there was also a part of her that distrusted that all was well. She wanted to be able to be vulnerable and open and ask for help and receive help. And she wanted to develop an optimistic outlook. And she also wanted to be able to commit to things that, um, she'd stop doing. So she wanted to be able to commit to going to yoga regularly because the pattern that she was adopting when we both started working with her was she would agree to go to yoga and then uh, to use her words, chicken out because she was worried about not being able to balance and she was worried about all the things that she might do that might embarrass herself. So her um, outcomes were to, once she'd worked on accepting herself and feeling safe, she then wanted to work on being able to commit. So Karen, next slide, please, thanks. So uh, the first thing that we talked about together was um, this concept of a positive mindset that actually um, that we, had, we had to sort of separate out the physical from the emotional. So accepting that absolutely, um, as a result of her stroke, she had had, um, her, her eyesight had been affected. Um, and that whilst there were certain things that could be done to support her, she, she was also in a place where she had to kind of accept that this is how it, this is, is as good as it's going to get for the moment. This is, this is how it's going to be for me. And she also 
um, had to really accept and uh, feel into what it was going to be like for her to have, as she described it, as this sort of numb leg, this cold leg. And for us, um, when we work with clients, it's for us, it's really important, that process of acceptance of I am where I am. And I want to, instead of judging that, what I want to do is to adopt a positive mindset around where I am right here, right now. And so we talked a lot about a positive mindset. We're going to come back to exploring that later. But we also talked about the benefits of it. And that, I think, is one of the things that I've certainly learned over the last probably two or three years. The importance of spending time with my clients, not just using tools, but helping them to understand why particular tools work and the um, all of the elements of the tool and what the tool will actually do. So for, for me, explaining a positive mindset um, in the context of once we're in that frame of mind, we can we can see the bigger picture um, when we're in panic and when we're in a negative mindset, we find it very difficult to see beyond. We'll talk a little bit about why we do that in a minute because of what our brain is doing. But we find it difficult to think creatively, to take in information, to problem solve and to bounce back because we're in, um, as we're going to be talking about later, fight or flight when we're in anxiety. And we're in a very closed down place. So it becomes very difficult for us to actually think our way out of the situation. Um, so we talked about the importance of a positive mindset and it being a, an ability, an opportunity to reframe her trauma. So to reframe the whole experience into, and, and Lorna already had this as part of her sort of philosophy, was it's a transformational experience and I know that I can actually use it as a transformational experience. Whilst she knew that intellectually, she didn't necessarily have this, the um, emotional structure to be able to take that on board. So we also talked about the impact that a positive mindset has on a cellular level. It's good for our immune system and it also increases our levels of trust. So we contextualised this positive mindset as the, as the sort of starting point. The next thing that um, I did, if we could just change the, the next slide for me, please, Caro, is... I really started to help her understand uh, what anxiety is. And as we all know, anxiety um, is uh, similar to fear. So it's generated by the same uh, parts of our brain as fear is. The difference is that fear is a response to the present, to the threat and to the danger. There is, uh, and we're programmed to do this because um, way back in in time we were under threat all the time things were wanting to eat us and chase us and attack us so fear is a really important safety mechanism and it's a th it's a response to present threat and danger what's here right now and the difference between fear and anxiety is that anxiety is a sense of dread and discomfort when there is no immediate threat or danger so we can program ourselves to be anxious and ultimately fearful of something um, if we perceive something as um, a threat. And if we choose to hold it as something that's frightening, we can then start to trigger off all those same responses in our brains. So what I wanted to do uh, when I was working with Lorna was to explain that there are two types of anxiety. What I describe, and I'm sure this isn't how um, lots of the books describe it, but I describe it as, as present and future. <coughs> Excuse me. So present anxiety is a response to something in the here and now. So what happens for us, and obviously then it can, it can become a fear response, are we hold um, memories of situations. So Lorna has a memory of having that stroke and she has a memory of, of how terrifying it was for her. There are triggers that happen in the, in the here and now uh, that can set off that memory. And immediately she will experience the same feelings that she experienced when she was having that stroke and she kicks off what we would describe as present anxiety. It's in the here and now, it's immediate response. <coughs> Excuse me. The second type of anxiety takes a little bit longer to build up. And the second type of anxiety is called future anxiety, where we 
start to think about something being frightening and we start to think about the consequences and we start to create anxiety as a response to our thoughts. So can you go on to the next slide, please, Karen? Sorry, a cough. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, so present is an instinctive reaction. Future is as a result of a worry loop and as a result of imagined outcomes. So let's have a look at how we create anxiety in our brains. If you can go on to the next slide, please, Carol, that's lovely, thanks. Okay, so here's a gorgeous picture. It's not um, anatomically correct. But I loved the colors, that's why I've chosen it. And um, we're not gonna be talking about all of the details in the brain. We're just gonna be talking about some uh, specifics. So that's why I chose it. So. If you could just click for me, Carol, thanks. So up at the top in the green part, we've got the cortex. And this is often described as our thinking brain. So this is where we do our reasoning, our rational rationalization um, and our processing. So this is um, where we uh, make decisions. Um, and this is also where we imagine and create our thoughts and um imaginings about fearful things and lovely things and as we're talking about anxiety we're going to be talking about how we create fearful thoughts so if you just go to the next one Karen thanks so the next part of our brain that's really important as part of this process is something called the limbic system which is the blue area some people call this the reptilian brain they call it <coughs> excuse me the ancient brain, they call it all sorts of things. But fundamentally, the limbic system is responsible for our emotional response. It doesn't have a lot of thinking going on, as in thoughts, so it's words. It's not working with the words. It's working with emotions and it's working with um, senses and memories. And those memories aren't sort of memories of... Um, the thought memories, their experience memories. And then the third part of our brain um, is the brainstem, which is to do with our instincts. So what happens is messages go through our brain, down our brainstem and into our bodies and tell our bodies what to do. So if you can just go to the next slide, please, Karen, that's lovely, thanks. So we've talked about um, the cortex. So if you can just click that one on for me, please. Uh, we've then talked about the next um, area. We've talked about the limbic system, but we're gonna be a bit more specific in the limbic system. So if you could click the next one for me, Cara, please. We're gonna be talking about the thalamus. Um, then we're gonna be talking about the amygdala. If you could click the next one, thank you. Then we're gonna be talking about the hypothalamus and then we're going to be talking a little bit later on about the frontal lobe. So these are all of the areas in our brains that are involved with anxiety. So if you can go to the next slide please Caro, thanks. So let's talk about the thalamus first of all. So the thalamus is um, the, I suppose, the, the doorway between the outside world and our brains. And it's the way, the place that collects information from the outside world. And the thalamus receives information from our senses. So it's a really important um, part of our brain. And what's interesting is it's receiving information in terms of um, what, it's, what it's seeing, what it's feeling, what the environment is like. Um, and at this point, it's fairly neutral. It's just receiving information. It's only when we start involving the amygdala, so if you could just flick to the next slide, please, for me, Karen, thanks, when things start to uh, happen. So the thalamus is receiving information and the amygdala is our early warning system. It's always on and it's always looking for danger. And its role is to kickstart fight, flight or freeze responses in our bodies. And so, when I was uh, working with uh, Lorna, it was really important that she understood that what she was doing was she was act her, her amygdala was activating an early warning system um, around some of the things that she was receiving. So when she was receiving things from the outside world, um, because of her past experiences and because of the things that she was storing in her experience system, 
she was responding to things. So she was seeing things and immediately starting to get anxious because anxiety was a way of protecting her. And Lorna's anxiety response is to freeze. So she stops. That's it. She, everything freezes. That's her response to anxiety. Other people, as we all know, have different anxiety um, responses. Um, my father's anxiety response is he had a stroke, as many of you know. And his anxiety response was to get really, really angry. And he would really lash out. So when he became anxious and afraid, I absolutely, he used to just go for us. And so when I did some work with him many years ago, it was about helping him to breathe through that response of wanting to hit out. So what the armadillo does, once it's received this information and it starts to think things are pretty dangerous here, it connects to the sympathetic nervous system via something called the central nucleus. And the central nucleus connects to the spinal cord right the way through to nearly every organ in the body. So basically the amygdala has a wonderful um, system whereby it can actually make sure that the whole body um, gets information. So uh, if you just go to the next one. So just very quickly, we've already said it works on triggers. It works on association, not logic, and it creates new associations for safety. So that's what was happening for Lorna was she was as she was um, going out into the world and she was experiencing walking and she was experiencing her responses, for example, on the bus when she felt really unsafe. Any kind of rocking feeling would send her into anxiety and would send her into to, to, to freeze. So what the, what the amygdala is doing is it's always updating its information. So it's, its early warning system can work really, really well. So the amygdala is the early warning system. How does the body get information? Well, that's through the hypothalamus. So if you'd just like to go to the next slide, Caro, thank you. Um, it receives signals from the central nucleus, as we've already said, is the, the means by which the amygdala communicates. And when it receives those signals, it releases cortisone, adre adrenaline, and hormones to prepare our body for immediate reaction, immediate action. So the uh, hypothalamus is really the, is the sort of communication, um, the messages, if you like, releases the cortisone, adrenaline, all the hormones right around the body, and now the body knows what to do. So in the case of cortisol, it increases our blood sugar levels, gives our muscles energy, and in terms of adrenaline, it heightens our senses and increases our heart rate. So our bodies are ready for action. So if you can go to the next slide, thank you, Sakara. So let's just recap on the process. So first thing that happens is sensory information comes in. That sensory information goes into the thalamus. Uh, now, the thalamus has two ways of processing information. We've been talking so far about the amygdala but the thalamus also sends information when we're not in um, an anxious situation. It, uh, it sends also sends information to our cortex. So it sends information to the cortex and the cortex sends information to the amygdala, but so does the thalamus. So the thalamus sending information to the amygdala is when we're in danger because the amygdala is checking all the time. And when it sees danger uh, or experiences danger, it goes into action. But our cortex is also receiving information. So we were talking a little bit earlier on about the difference between uh, present and future anxiety. So present anxiety is thalamus to amygdala. I, I'm not even thinking about it. It's, it's quick, it takes an experience, it's an anxiety provoking experience, Woof, the amygdala works and suddenly it's giving information out to the rest of the body. But the thalamus is also taking information to the cortex. And the future anxiety is when we start to worry and we start to um, panic about things and we start to think about things. So it's those sleepless nights that we have. So Lorna had both things going on. She had immediate environmental things which were triggering her anxiety and sending her into immediate anxiety. 
But she was also, and as a result of that immediate anxiety, she was also having future anxiety because she was worrying about what might happen. So if we take the example of the bus, she'd be on the bus and she would have, the bus would wobble, she'd have an immediate fear, um, anxiety response, and she'd freeze. So she'd, and she'd start um, hyperventilating, she'd start to get uh, a cold sweat, she'd start to experience in the moment a response to this uh, threat. She'd go home and have a cup of tea, tell herself that things were all right. And then in the middle of the night, she'd start the, oh gosh, I'm probably not gonna be able to go on the bus again. And this might even get to the point where I actually can't even go out. And then she would re-experience anxiety in the middle of the night through a panic attack because of the fear that she was creating as a result of the um, experiences that she'd been having during the day. So if you can just add the other two under there for me, Carrie. So we've got the hypothalamus and you've got the anxiety. So thalamus takes an information, either sends it to the cortex or sends it to the amygdala. Um, the cortex, if the cortex is receiving it, so um, she's having these thoughts at night, she starts to send information because she's re, if you imagine she's, she's uh, replaying the bus experience. So she's imagining herself on the bus She's seeing all the things that she saw when she was experiencing that anxiety in real life a few hours before. And the amygdala goes, blimey, she's in danger again. Sends uh, information to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then sends information around the body, sends the cortisone, the adrenaline around the body and Lorna's in anxiety. And that's when Cara and I met her when she was saying, I I'm, I'm really struggling with this because I'm, not only experiencing anxiety in the moment, but I'm also working myself up into a real lather about this and I'm experiencing panic attacks and anxiety at night. So we spent a lot of time working with her to understand this process. And I think one of the things that I've experienced when um, clients really deeply understand how their brains work, it's empowering because suddenly I know why this is happening. Because one of the things that Lorna would talk about a lot is I don't know what's going on. I don't know why this is happening and, I, and, and I'm out of control. And for, for us, the first stage was to give her back control. And through the process of understanding how her brain was creating this anxiety, gave her this incredible sense, uh, interestingly enough, of calm and control. So we then went on to just swap the next slide for me, please, Caro, thank you. We then talked about how important anxiety, healthy anxiety is. So actually, some of the anxiety that Lorna was experiencing was actually healthy anxiety. It was important that her body was ready and prepared um, for things that might happen. But what we didn't want was unhealthy anxiety, where it, was so, it took to such an extent that it was actually freezing her. So what we wanted her to be able to do was to have healthy anxiety, as in uh, um, anxious, or a little bit anxious about that, because that's actually really good for us. When we're sort of, in, as we all know, when we're preparing for a presentation, it's really good occasionally to feel that, oh, I'm starting to get a little bit sort of anxious about, oh, this is, but it's really important to have that anxiety blended with excitement. And I love this, and I was, when I was thinking about an image to, to use tonight, this little guy is from Up, and uh, he's just about to uh, go and help somebody. And he's he's a really little bit nervous about uh, what he's going to be doing. And he's kind of a little bit, oof, I don't know what's going to happen. But he's so excited and so keen. And what that healthy anxiety, that healthy kind of readiness is all about is actually getting our bodies ready. So we're getting lots of blood flowing to the brain. We're increasing our heart rate and we're really getting ready for action. So healthy anxiety is really good. Unhealthy anxiety, if you could flip to the next slide for me, please, Caro, is very bad for us. And what it was important for uh, me to, to really help Lorna understand that not only was her unhealthy anxiety affecting her mental health, it was also affecting her body and it was affecting her body's ability to respond. So she was experiencing palpitations and she was experiencing those palpitations throughout the day. 
She was experiencing problems with her respiratory system. So she was finding herself getting out of breath. And one of the things that she was also discovering was that she'd, she'd be walking to the bus stop and then suddenly she'd be out of breath. And of course, being out of breath doesn't help you when you've then got to make a step up um, onto the bus. And bearing in mind that I've always said she's, she's had some um, visual challenges, then not being holding her breath, um, tension in her muscles was actually putting her in um, a physical position where she wasn't actually able to get on that bus particularly well. So helping her to understand not only how her brain was creating the anxiety, but also the impact of that anxiety on her body. So her being able to recognise, gosh, actually, I am holding my breath. I am starting to um, breathe uh, very quickly. And so it was really useful in this process because one of the first stage um, of working with a client around um, anxiety is awareness. What was really interesting was in the process of her noticing what she noticed about her body and becoming aware of, gosh, I do have tension in my arms. And we started to talk about, you know, explain what it feels like and how it, how it sort of plays out for you. She was already starting to make some really significant changes. And she was already starting to uh, utilize uh, breathing practices on her own without any support from me or from Caro. She was starting to practice these things in response to what she was realizing about her own body. So that's for me why I think it's really important or why I um, use uh, lots of explanations um, with my clients when we're sort of working around anxiety so that they feel in control and they can also start to think about the kind of responses that they can make and the changes that they can make. So we then went on to, so if we just want to go to the next one, I love this particular um, quote, and it's one I use a lot and, and use with, with Lorna. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So we had this as a bit of a mantra for the work we were doing. So this wasn't only about if you look at your body differently, but it's also about how we look at the world and how we look at the things around us. And so we started to um, really open up the possibility of curiosity that actually maybe some of the things that I am finding I'm feeling anxious about and I'm creating some real worries and fears around actually aren't actually dangerous. So maybe those things, they're actually OK and they're safe. So we use this um, as, a, as a kind of a, a sort of a central mantra um, as Lorna started to do the work. So if you can just flick on to the next one. Some of you have seen this slide before. Um, one of the things that I started to do when I was working with Lorna was to introduce her to these different forms of positivity. Um, and so, uh, and, and again, I explained um, about these different um, forms of positivity and explained to her how we were going to be using them in our conversations and in our sessions together and how we were going to be using them around her physical rehabilitation so how we were going to be using it around in particular her balance and sense of um, sturdiness and, and safety when she was actually standing up in in places like buses when they were moving around how she was going to use these as tools to um, support her as she was um, doing all the physical activities she wanted to do so it was really important she had actually forgotten about um, the joy of being able to move um, and she'd got, she'd got herself in such an interesting place she was so fixated in staying still to keep herself safe that she'd actually forgotten that moving when she was moving before was actually really joyful so we used the memories of joy um, we used lots and lots of amusement and humor uh, Lorna has the most incredible sense of humour and uh, we use the sense of her sense of humour in all sorts of lovely ways. Um, and we also use gratitude an awful lot. And she she um, kept a gratitude journal and she used that gratitude journal to be really, really appreciative of all the courage and the um, just the gutsiness that she's got. Um, so you 
we, we there are lots of different exercises we're not going to go into them tonight but there are lots of different things you can use around um, these 10 forms of positivity when working with the clients and as I said we use particularly joy and gratitude which I'll come on to how we use those um, in a minute oh and or sorry I've got all we use all quite a lot as well so just want to go on to the next slide please Caro so uh I talked again, um, I talked to very earlier on when we were saying that um, we're using the same um, system um, positively. So revisited her brain and talked about actually when you're thinking about positive things and you're using um, those sort of forms of pos positivity, what you're doing is doing exactly the same system that's going on in your brain as you were when you were worrying. But in this particular instance, what you're doing is you're using your brain, and I, we laugh about using your brain for a change, but what you're doing is triggering oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, and as those um, uh, neurotransmitters move around the body, they're sending lots and lots of beautiful signals around your body, and you can do that by encouraging yourself to think about things that make you happy, um, to think about how amazing you are, um, and to think about how much fun you're going to have when you're out and about and doing the things that you want to be able to do. And we've talked in other um, webinars about visualisation and we've talked about mental rehearsal. Um, and so I used with Lorna a combination of mental rehearsal and visualisation um, around all sorts of positive um, images as part of Lorna's journey and as part of uh, creating a positive mindset for her. So um, if we just go to the next slide, Caro. Okay, so I love this picture. Lorna's particularly fond of, of dogs, so I wanted to put this in there because um, she loves them. So uh, that's why he's there. Uh, stepping into positivity. So the first thing that um, I really encouraged Lorna to do was to become curious. And we've also already sort of talked a little bit about that um, in terms of the curiosity that she had around how her brain works, how um, her limbic system works and how anxiety was created and how she can create positivity and how she can create a sense of peace for herself uh, by using the same system, but using it differently or sending different chemicals around her, her system. Lorna's curiosity was really important to her, um, her adventurousness and to her experimentation. Um, and I think one of the key things was that as she started to understand more and more about how her body worked and how her brain worked, she became curious to experiment. And she became very curious to be aware of what was happening. So as I talked about earlier, she started to notice, OK, so I'm going towards the bus and I notice what I notice about how I'm experiencing that walk to the bus stop. And Lorna then started to catch herself in the judgment. She also started to catch herself as she started to build the anxiety. And so Lorna developed a whole new set of habits around the walk to the bus stop. Um, and so we worked on stopping and just taking a moment to just relax and to breathe. So as she noticed her anxiety start to build, she noticed it through how, she, how hot she was feeling um, and how she was starting to sort of, her muscles were starting to freeze. She started to build in breathing and relaxation and just taking the time, we talked about awe, one of the things that Lorna really loves is she loves birds. She absolutely loves um, just taking, she loves wildlife and she loves just taking the time to notice. And so what she would do on the walk to the bus is that um, she would just practice stopping, breathing, and then looking up and just noticing if she could see any birds in the trees or around her and then noticing um, if she could hear any bird song. And as she listened to the bird song, she loves bird song, calm her down. And she then started to um, remember as well. We started to introduce um, accessing memories of success and positivity 
Um, we also talked about her using music, so having her phone, having her headphones with her so that she could pop music on. And she used music, particularly on the bus, um, and she used a particular piece of music so that she could just put the, her headphones in, breathe, relax, and just really, really flow into the music. So we can use lots and lots of things because what we're doing in effect is rewiring the brain and we're giving the brain different ex or the amygdala different experiences of things that we once found frightening and um, things that we would actually think, gosh, this is something I must be on high alert for. We're now saying, well, this is an experience which you can actually enjoy and be really calm and really relaxed. So do you want to go to the, the next one? So. For me, the key things, I think, when it comes to um, a positive mindset and using a positive mindset with something like balance is to really create this um, sense of appreciation and self-compassion. So through the journey, as we've already talked about, of understanding how my body works, understanding how my brain works, marvelling and... Um, being in awe of, gosh, is that how my body works? And is that how I create what I create? And instead of seeing anxiety as something which is, which is negative and something which is, gosh, that's, that's, I wish I didn't do that. And so in Lorna's case, um, what she would do is she'd criticise herself. She would tell herself off for getting uh, worried. She would tell herself off about her responses on the bus. So part of her would be saying, you know, you should be able to do this. The other part of was saying I, I it was absolutely responding and really sort of in panic. Um, what she began to learn to do was to, was to do three things. She began to appreciate her body and how amazing her body and her mind actually, or her brain actually was. She began to experience, really appreciate how she could change things and to have this really beautiful self-compassion. So she... And what was so lovely working with her was, was just being part of her journey as she stepped from criticism and blame um, and sadness around herself to appreciation, to awe um, and to wonderment at what she'd achieved. So we were able then to really honour how she had uh, the journey that she'd been on and the experience experiences that she'd had and how amazing she was uh, to be in the situation that she was in now and how incredible she was and, and able to move forward so that appreciation self-compassion bringing in awe bringing in joy and bringing in self-love really really important the next thing that's really important in this set is to notice the triggers and we've talked a little bit about that with Lorna's story about um, how she started to notice what was happening as she walked to the bus stop um, and noticing those triggers. And what's interesting for some people is when they first notice those triggers, they can play out that crossness and that frustration. Oh God, I did it again yesterday. And what I always encourage my clients to do is to just be amazingly grateful. I've just noticing my triggers. Isn't this interesting? And earlier on, I was talking about Lorna's humor and her uh, amusement. And um, she's, she was amazing to work with around this because we began to just find it funny. Um, and she developed a really lovely way of describing um, the, the sort of the process of, of getting out of breath. And I would, some of it was a bit rude and it, it was just beautiful how she described it. And she'd started to laugh about, oh, I did it again yesterday, it started. And one of the things that uh, was really interesting is, is when you start to find something funny, you're also starting to move through it. And so for me, that ability to notice that trigger, to find it amusing, to find joy in identifying that response and then being able to move through it was really beautiful. So we identify the triggers, we identify the responses. And one of the things I've talked about also was, was how important deep breathing or breathing is in this process. Now I know lots of people, we all sort of look at the, you know, the breathing into the, the, the paper bag when we get anxious which is one way, but that for me is, is quite an extreme version of the breathing. And so um, there are lots of beautiful uh, breathing techniques that you can use. And um, uh, if any of you are interested, you want to drop me a line at, at contact at RRC. Um, 
then I can give you some links to some really beautiful books that you can use with your clients on deep breathing and how to use that deep breathing um, once they've noticed the trigger, um, how they can use it um, around the triggers and how they can use it when um, they're further, a little bit further down the road and they're in the response uh, stage, how they can use their deep breathing exercises and different techniques. Uh, so that's deep breathing. Um, relaxation, um, lots of people uh, use different mindfulness exercises and relaxation exercises, and they're really, really good for um, the cortex, um, the sort of future worry or the future anxiety. Um, they're really, really useful techniques. But there are also some really simple little things that we can do in the moment to relax our bodies. And Kara, you, whenever you listen to Kara, she's always talking about, um, we always start with the breath. There is the breath and there's also the relaxation of our muscles. So there are some lovely, really simple, quick little techniques that people can do for um, anxiety in the moment and anxiety in the future. Those of you who've come on our webinars before know visualisation is something that's dear to our hearts. Um, and last week we talked about mental rehearsal. Mental rehearsal is a great tool um, to uh, really practice um, the body movements. So we used a little bit of mental rehearsal um, for uh, Lorna when she was uh, practicing getting on the bus and she was practicing in her mind how she was going to, how far she had to walk before she could hold on to um, the handles. So we use mental rehearsal for her um, just to get her on and off the bus, but you can also use it in lots of different ways with um, clients um, in different aspects around anxiety. So you can rehearse uh, standing up, you can rehearse sitting down, you can rehearse st standing still or moving, you can rehearse all sorts of amazing things. Um, and visualization. So for me, the, the difference between mental rehearsal and visualization is mental rehearsal is about us rehearsing a particular set of movements. And visualization is more general, and visualization is more about imagining um, a really positive future. So I just want to end on a little story. So um, we've been talking about Lorna's journey, and um, I just wanted to share with you where she uh, finally uh, really conquered her anxiety around her peripheral vision. So we've been working together for, for a, a number of months and uh, Lorna decided that she was going to go on holiday and uh, she was going to go with a friend. So she was really clear that um, she it was her first holiday, um, sort of proper long holiday that she was going on um, after, just after a stroke. She'd been a little sort of weekends away, but this was a sort of I think it was a two two week holiday. And this was she was flying and uh, she was negotiating the airport and uh, she was negotiating getting on and off coaches. So there was lots of elements to this holiday that were um, just amazing. So we did a session together. She went off on holiday and uh, she contacted me when she'd got back from a holiday. And she said, um, just wanted to, to share with you uh, how my holiday's gone. So I'm really excited. And I, I was expecting to hear her tell me she'd been to Malta and I was expecting her to tell me about the places that she'd visited and you know how it would have been like and I was particularly curious about the airport because she'd talked a lot about how um, up until this point she'd felt really nervous about being with lots and lots of people in a, in a big sort of open space. She didn't talk about any of that, she talked about the fact that she walked down a mountain and I have to say, even when I talk about it now, I get really, really sort of tearful at the prospect. So this particular um, sort of, I think it was a hill more than a mountain, but in, in our world, we've kind of given it the, the title of mountain. Um, and it was, it had um, a uh, rope uh, handrail, which wobbled, and that was it. There, there was the step and then the, the great beyond and a handrail. A, 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 um, a rope handrail and Lorna and another amazing lady that she met when she was out there decided that they were going to overcome their fears and they were going to really uh, enjoy the experience so the lady that she walked down the mountain with um, had a fear of heights and Lorna bless her using all the stuff that we had talked about. She helped her to do some breathing. She helped her to develop um, all sorts of different techniques. And together, 
they came down this mat at this hill mountain um and it was just the most incredible um ending to a journey which was just profound and what was so lovely when she described the walking down the mountain and all the elements of this experience she said and it doesn't matter and I get really tearful that I can't see in the way I used to see because I'm just seeing differently and that was just such an amazing amazing experience uh, for her and one that she now uses in her visualizations and all the things that she does she she goes back to that time and she uses that whenever she's feeling a little bit scared or a little bit worried about something that's her anchor point which I think is absolutely beautiful so we're at five to seven so um I think that's uh, as much as I'd like to talk about tonight thank you Caro so um those are how you can contact us. So if, uh, as I said earlier, if you do want to um, find out uh, some names of books and various bits and bobs, then just contact me at contact at rrc.life and I'll happily put you in touch with them um, or, or put, signpost you to the books, etc. So that's me. Have we got any questions? Are you coming back, Caro? Because I can see an amorphous blob. <laughs> Is she coming back? doesn't look like it so i'm just want to um are there any questions in our i'm back I'm you're back, back. <laughs> took took a bit <laughs> i was pushing buttons and then my, yeah. sc my screen disappeared <laughs> where are you I so i don't know whether we've got any questions have we got any um, questions or we haven't got any questions but i just wanted to say thank you so much um it was emotional with lorna yeah. Um, I didn't realise, I was just, I really just, well, I had a little moment then, because I was just reflecting. I did too, because I remember all the work that we did, and yeah. uh, and you did, and I did, and, and it was wonderful that she managed to achieve that, and, mm. and I think, yeah, I think it's normal, you know, when we have people that we're working with, you know, when they, we, we travel that journey with them, don't we, we, you know, and, and, and it is emotional when they do something, you know, they, they overcome something it's a wonderful thing mm. so yes um no questions at the moment um has anybody got any questions um is everybody still there <laughs> <laughs> people are there people are there <laughs> must have covered it so well chris that it, it was a, a really really interesting talk and uh, i think um, one of the things that i was just going to say i think one of the things that i've certainly enjoyed um sort of uh, through the process of working with clients he's also learning I've learned so much about the human body yeah. as well and um I think learning to how to talk about our bodies with our clients in a way that's really growthful and um life enhancing is, yeah. is really really special and I think what's interesting um I was just reflecting on, on Lorna a little bit there she's now taken all that information and I, what I love is that she's doing work with other people so it's just what I was thinking about yeah. coming down the mountain I was just thinking how she worked with that lovely lady that she came down the mountain with and how she's been doing work with them um, she's got another uh, friend of hers hasn't she Paul who's um who had a stroke after her and uh, how she's been using so many of the different techniques with him um, which I just think is absolutely lovely how that um, how you can sort of help each other so once you've got um, a set of tools and an understanding then you just support each other and that's what that Lorna and, and Paul are doing and Claire and lots of others are, are all sort of helping each other out aren't they and sort of practicing things together um, and, and making I think what's lovely is they've made um, something that was you know they described as really frightening and scary and anxiety into something now that they all have a bit of a laugh about and just sort of go oh, that's my anxiety trigger or uh, they, they use something a little bit ruder than that but anyway we won't go there so i want to say thank you and, and thank you everybody Pleasure. who's come on and watched and just go into chat to get those links if you if you're not a community member do come and join us it's free to join um or you know sign up for our newsletter we won't be bombarding you it's just a weekly roundup and so we'd love to see you in the community. And Chris, um, further future webinars. We're, we're done now, aren't we? Until you done, know. We're, we're done until the new year. Um, yeah. And in the new year, we're going to be uh, moving on a little bit because we've had lots of people ask us, can we do some more detailed um, 
webinars can, can we can we go into things in a much more detail so the first thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be and we're going to um sharon our other colleagues are going to be joining us along with liana is we're going to be um exploring our brains we're going to be really deep diving into um i wouldn't say we're going to be new neuroscientists but we're certainly going to be looking at how our brains work and, and actually how we as therapists whether we're hands-on therapists or talking therapists or whichever um, discipline we come from um, how we can use uh, the knowledge or how we can help our clients learn about their brains and then uh, utilize their brains for the changes that they want to make so uh, that's going to be coming out and we're going to be publicizing that I think in the in the middle of January so I hope that you've all enjoyed tonight and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye.